Yes, why? Don't forget we're in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regarding your voices, inshallah. It comes in the narration, Umar al-Khattab, Ratil al-Anhu heard some men raising their voices in the masjid. And he asked them where they were from, and they said, Ta'if. He said, had you been from Al-Medina, I would have beaten you. And the ulama have explained the narration that had they been from Al-Medina, they would have been knowledgeable of the affairs of the masjid, and therefore, they would have been held liable. But because they were from out of town and did not know better, he made that excuse. At any rate, we see in his instruction and in his statement that one should keep their voices down in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To the point where Shaykh al-Bani, rahimahullah ta'ala, ya khwa, he mentions that even if one is supplicating or one is reciting Quran, one should not do so in such a way that it disturbs those who are with them in the masjid. And that is with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how much more other than that from everyday speech? So we are mindful and rem uh, of the etiquettes of the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. Alhamdulillah. Hamdan kathiran tayyiban mubarakan fi. Kama yuhibbu rabbuna wa yarda. وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وبعد. We continue with Quran Allah be with you. In our discussion, in our reading of the life and the teachings of our noble Sheikh Abu Abdul Rahman Muqbil Ibn Hadi Al Wadi Rahimah Allah Taala. And something of our days with him in the Maj. And today, inshallah ta'ala, ikhwan, I wanted to begin by talking about a day in the Maj. We spoke a bit about the makeup of the Marakaz, the center, the Wadi, the, the Mezra, where the married students lived. And today, inshallah ta'ala, ikhwan, I wanted to begin, as we said, to talk about what a day was like. Students constantly ask me, how does one manage their time properly as a student of knowledge? And Allah, ikhwan, one must first understand that there is no time to waste. One must first understand that there is no time to waste. Before deciding to manage one's time, one must first understand and realize that there is no time to waste. But we had to divide our days up in the match between several affairs. First, Ikhwan, there were Drus, which we'll be talking about tonight in some detail. The main lessons of the Shaykh himself, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, as well as the lessons of the students. And they were plentiful, Ikhwan in every science from the sciences of Islam. So there was first Duru Shaykhwan. One had to also make time for Hidh, for memorization. One also had to make time for Muraja'ah, for reprising or revising that which the person memorized and learned. There also had to be time for Bah, for those who were involved in research, and collecting and gathering, as well as Qira'ah, as well as just simply reading to benefit. So can you imagine now, Ikhwan, all of that needed to be done so as to become a talib or tamekkin, a strong, well-grounded student of knowledge. And we begin, Ikhwan, by mentioning what the Shaykh he mentioned Rahimahullah ta'ala, as his advice as it relates to the students of knowledge, he said, al muhafidh ala al waqt wa sihha He advised the students of knowledge with preserving their time and their health. Preserving their time and their health. Because Rawa al-Bukhari fi sahihin, and Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah, 
قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم نعمتان مغبون فيهما كثير من الناس الصحة والفراغ He mentioned this narration in Quran collective by Imam al-Bukhari in his Sahih. As we said on the authority of the noble companion Abdullah ibn Abbas, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said there are two blessings in which many people incur loss. So the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called these two things a blessing. He named them blessings. And he said to Quran that there are many people, many people who incur loss as it relates to these two blessings. May they don't receive them or don't take the benefit from them. As-sihha, good health. wal firah and free time. Yani, and some of the scholars have explained free time to do that which is good. So the Shaykh, he mentions this narration Rahimahullah Ta'ala in his advice to the student of knowledge to manage his time properly, manage his time well. This also, Ikhwan, Allah reminds us of the narration of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Yaqtanim Khamsin Qabala Khams, take advantage of five before five, Shababaka Qabal, Haramika, your youth before your old age. Your good health before your sickness. Your wealth before your poverty. And your free time before you are busy. So therefore, if you come again, these narrations that we are now mentioning, They remind us, of course, Ikhwan, of the importance of taking care of our time and managing our time properly and understanding that there is no time to waste. Ibn Hajjah Ikhwan in Fashul Bari, he brings the statement of Ibn Jawzi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, as it relates to the narration that there are many who incur loss in those two blessings of time and good health, free time and good health. Ibn Jawzi said, Ikhwan, قَدْ يَكُونَ الْإِنسَانِ صَحِيحًا وَلَا يَكُونَ مُتَفَرِّغًا It could be that a person, Ikhwan, has good health, but doesn't have any free time. يُشُغْلِهِ بِالْمَعَاشِ Because he is busy chasing or seeking after provisions. He's too busy working. He doesn't have time to sit and study in the likes of this. So he's healthy, but he doesn't have, so he has that one blessing of health, but he doesn't have that blessing of free time. وَقَدْ يَكُونْ مُسْتَغْنِيًا وَلَا يَكُنْ صَحِيحًا And maybe he has plenty of time, but he has bad health. And therefore he's still unable to stand with that which he needs to stand with from the likes of that which we are talking about. فَذِ اجْتَمَعَ فَغَلَبَ عَلِهِ الْكَسَلِ عَنِ الْطَاعَةِ وَهُوَ الْمَغْبُونَ And the Mujawzi says at the end of this ikhwan, but if he has both of those two blessings, Meaning he has his health and he has good time and he has free time, excuse me, to do actions of good but he is overcome by laziness then he is from those Ikhwan who have incurred loss as it relates to those two blessings. The one who was mentioned in that narration. So imagine now Ikhwan when a person asks about studying and memorizing the likes of this and you ask the person how much he has memorized today And he is busy with his telephone, he is busy with يعني, social media and other than that, Ikhwan, la verifikum, and does not take from the time to memorize an ayat from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or a hadith from the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ikhwan. There are times when an individual could be memorizing something but he is engrossed in vain speech. Al Khatib al Baghdadi in his tremendous work, Al Jami'ah, The Akhlaq al-Rabi wa Dhab al-Samir, the character of the seeker of hadith. He mentioned that one of the scholars, Ikhwan, exited from his home. He came out of his home and he was sort of mumbling to himself. But he wasn't mumbling, as we'll find out. And some of his students who were waiting for him by the door began to have, tried to talk with him, have everyday speech with him. How are you doing like this? And he told them, be quiet. For I am memorizing that which I just heard from narrations. 
did not want them to busy him with everyday common speech as he was busy memorizing the narrations of the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now we know if there's a time for this and there's a time for that. Sa'a was sa'a. But unfortunately, some of us only have the sa'a and not the other sa'a. What we mean by the requirement is the memorization and the study of the deen of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So it's important that we understand as Shaykh Allah Shaykh Mukul is advising with us here with it, taking advantage of your time and managing your time well. And the Shaykh Iqwan, as he used to mention quite often, in his days in the Islamic University of Al-Madinah, he would be diligent upon managing his time and studying and focusing on studying in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He mentions Iqwan that when some of the people were busy with what was going on in the newspapers and what was happening in this land and that land, the Shaykh said we were busy with Jamia and Tirmidhi. We were busy with what was going on in the Jamia of Imam Tirmidhi. Studying the books of Hadith and reading them amongst themselves and benefiting from the, the different meanings and the likes of this in those narrations. And to so the point of where we find in the narration of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam كَانِ يَدْعُ بِهَذِهِ الدَّعَوَاتِ أَلَّهُمَ إِنْ يَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنْ عِلْمٍ لَا يَنْفَعْ the narration of the Messenger of Allah where well, he sought refuge from first and foremost knowledge that does not benefit. Knowledge that does not benefit. And a heart that does not find fear or have fear. And a dua that is not answered supplication that is not answered and the soul that is never satisfied does not have qana'ah it's never satisfied and that hadith ikhwan from the hadith of Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu akhrajuhu al-nisai wa sahihu al-albani now this narration ikhwan as it relates to that affair of knowledge that does not benefit some in misinterpret the meaning of this narration. As Sheikh Ibn Ubaz, he was asked the choir regarding this and what is the meaning of knowledge that does not benefit. The Sheikh, he said, Kullu imla yanfa fihi. Every knowledge that does not benefit a person, meaning that he is not beneficial to that individual. Hatta ilm al Even knowledge of the legislation. And it's not closely the choir. If a person learns some knowledge but doesn't work by it or doesn't benefit by it, it becomes a proof against him. So in that instance, it was not beneficial knowledge for him. So the individual when he learns something, in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears it, memorizes it, can cite it, but works against it works opposite to that which he learned. That knowledge did not benefit him. And therefore it falls under that which is understood in this narration. And in the Ashaq of Nubaz, does this mean worldly knowledge? Often when, when people, when we ask them what is intended by this narration, often people say worldly knowledge. However, the Shaykh said, لا علوم الدنيا قد تنفع some of these sciences and the knowledges of the worldly life are beneficial. Look what the Shaykh says. The carpenter is benefited by his knowledge. Imagine now if one of the people the carpenter who has skills and the abilities to build walls and roofs and floors and the likes of this. And then he uses those skills to help build the masjid, for example. To help construct the masjid, and better than that, he masjid then, but Allah lahu baitin fil jannah. Who narrates that narration? Huh? Uthman ibn Affan. Now, so he uses those skills, ya ikhwan, la barifikum. 
in the construction of a masjid, for example, or to build a home for a family, a Muslim family, so as to find shelter. That knowledge is beneficial. As Sheikh Allah Sheikh Ibn Ubaz is mentioning here, so therefore one should not understand from that that simply because it is a knowledge of the worldly life, of the dunya, that it is not beneficial. It's a tremendous point. The Sheikh he goes on to say, Sheikh Ibn Ubaz, Allah Ta'ala, لَكِنْ بَعْضُ النَّاسِ عِنْدُهُ عُلُوم السُّ Some people may have knowledge of the legislation, for example, or religion, or like this. However, the knowledge does not benefit them, as we said, يَا إِخْوَانِ لَا يَنْفَاهُ حُجَّ عَلَيْهِمْ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ That knowledge will be a proof against them on the day of resurrection. An example of that. We talked, Ikhwan, about the Qadriya. Those who deny the divine decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we mentioned from the narration of Yahya bin Ya'mar regarding him and his companion, Rameed ibn al-Rahman al-Himyari, traveling to make Hajj Umrah and meeting with Abdullah ibn Umar and informing him about the affair of those who were denying the divine decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What was the name of that man? who was at the head of those individuals who denied the divine decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Huh? Ma'bad al-Juhun. And where, was it, where were they at? Basra. I said back to the brother. In Basra. So he informed Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma regarding their affair, affair yaqra'oon al-Qur'an wa taqafroon al-ilma as we said that they were recited of the Qur'an and diligent students of knowledge. So that Iqwan means that they were seeking knowledge, but was that knowledge beneficial to them? Of course not. Of course the knowledge was not beneficial to them because in that regard, they denied the divine decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how many verses did they memorize that establish and affirm belief in the divine decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How many ahadith in the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did they memorize and learn and affirm and establish the divine decree of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and still they deny? So that is illa yanfa' why? Because on the day of resurrection that will be a hujja alayhim, it will be a proof against them. So it did not benefit benefit them rather, darrahu, rather than harm them. Because they learned that knowledge of quality of Hukum and they worked against it. And as we know, Ikhwan, Al-Qur'an hujjatun lak aw ali. The Qur'an will either be approved for you or against you. So we're talking, Ikhwan, about, again, managing one's time. We look at a day, as we said in the Maj, beginning at Al-Fajr. Beginning at Salat al-Fajr. And we mentioned the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Inna Qur'an al-Fajr, Indeed, the recitation of Al-Fajr is ever witnessed. Indeed, the recitation of the Quran at Fajr is ever witnessed. And the scholars of Tafsir al have mentioned that what is intended here, a Tashhaduha Malaikas al that is witnessed by the recitation of the prayer for Al-Fajr. Is witnessed by the angels of the night and of the day. So it was a tremendous time of Quran at Fajr. Now, of course, the ulama have explained that what is intended in the ayah is the actual recitation of Fajr. But I wanted to make a point here, Quran, that what you would find after Salat al Fajr would be the time when most of the students, or many of the students, you would find them focus upon the Quran. You would see a Quran, for example, Allah ibn Fikum. Students walking around the masjid. I mean, so let's look at this, this room here. So imagine now you see people just walking around the masjid with the, with the mushaf in their hand, and you just see them revising that which they have memorized. Just walking around, completely around, like this, around the entire room, wall to wall, back and forth, just memorizing, revising that which they had learned. You will see other students in Quran sitting together and one would be reading on another student and he would be checking his recitation, his memorization of his recitation, correcting them if need be. And then you would find others in Quran who were simply sitting and they were memorizing from the Quran. Some of us in Quran, it was the habit to try to memorize a wedge. 
yani a, 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 yani a, a, a face of a page every day. Every day. And the method of, of memorization of the Quran is simply what we mentioned before, and I'll read something of this from Shaykh Mubba momentarily as well. But the methodology of Quran memorization was something of which Imam al Bukhari, when he was asked about how he memorized so many narrations, he said simply a word. This comes to some of the biographies of Imam al Bukhari. He said, Etzakrar. Repetition. We do it over and over and over again. And that is what we found in that narration that we mentioned from Al Khatib al Baghdadi of that particular scholar who stopped the students from speaking to him. He was revising, he was repeating the narration to himself. He said, over and over again. And so what we do with Quran is we would take the ayah, the first ayah, we read it once from the page, read it twice from the page, read it three times from the page, then don't look at the page and recite it from memory. And then when you have it, you move on to the second verse, but you continue to read the first verse with the second verse three times. Four times until you have it. Don't look at the page and then you recite the first and second verse from memory. You go back in, you add the third verse. You do that three, but you, you take the first and the second verse all the way down until you finish the page of Quran And in that way, because of that repetition, by Allah's permission, it makes it easier for one to memorize that which they have read. And along with the memorization of the Quran, of course, one has to revise and review that which they have memorized from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from the students of those Quran who would review at least a juz every day in the morning, as we said after Fajr in particular, was the time when we find many of the students focused on the memorization and the revision of what they memorized from the Quran. As we said, in most cases, at least a juz a day. One thirtieth of the Quran a day, the students would revise, and that was they had learned. So perhaps in the first day, let's say, for example, they would review the first juz of the Baqarah. The second day, even after memorizing something else, perhaps they would review the second juz, and like this. So the point is, Ikhwala Bifikum, the focus for many of the students after Salat al Fajr was in the Quran. And there's a nice hadith, Ikhwan, from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Collected by a Tirmidhi in his Jami and authenticated by Shaykh al-Albani. Rahimahullah ta'ala. Man salla al-fajr fi jama'ah. Thumma qa'ada yadhkur Allah ta'ala hatta tatra al-shams. Thumma salla raka'atayn kanat lahu. Ki ajri hajja wa umrah. Tamma, tamma. The whoever prays fajr. Shaykh al-Albani authenticates his narration as we mentioned. In congregation, and then he sits and he remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he sits and remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until the sun rises. And then he prays to Raka, Raka Atim, and Duha. He will receive the reward of a Hajj or Umrah completely, completely. Or complete Hajj, complete Umrah. Or like this. Shaykh ibn Abbas, he says, according to the explanation of this narration, that the person that the person sits in the place of his prayer where he prayed so he sits there he remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or he recites the Quran at that time and look what Shaykh Nubah says after this حَتَّى تَرَتَّهِ الشَّمْسِ until the, shem, until the sun rises ثُمَّ يُسَلِّ رَقَعْتَيْهِ then he prays to رَقَعْ فَإِنْهُ يَحْسُ لَهُ مَا وَرَدَ فِي الْأَحَدِي he will receive the reward that is found in the narrations. So we see Iqwan, the tremendous benefit of sitting in that moment, not just going off and going perhaps back to sleep, we're going to do this, but to sit and remember Allah and to sit with the Quran at that particular time. And there's no question also, Iqwan, that after Fajr, after one has slept well, that the mind is fresh. The mind is fresher, more open to receive information to memorize things, to withhold things that, 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 that the mind hears and, 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 and learns. And therefore, Quran, the time after Fajr is a perfect time for the Quran. For the memorization of the Quran, for revising the Quran, reviewing the Quran, revising that which you have memorized, studying the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, we understand the Quran, we read the Quran at any time during the day, all throughout the day. But the point that we're making here is in the management of time and looking at a time for memorization and the time for review and the likes of this, 
after the fact, is a perfect time in quantum as you will, especially before one gets busy with the affairs of work and children and other than that. And after Ikhwan, this time we will find, for example, in Ikhwan, the students would begin to have their meals. Those who were on the single side, on the side of the Ma'ad, of the Marquez, that's when they would take their meal, uh, their breakfast. And as I said before, Ikhwan, it was basically yani food, yani beans, with a lot of water in it, and a pretty hard piece of, uh, of bread. And it was... It sufficed, alhamdulillah. But the students would take their breakfast at that point, and then you would begin to see the durus begin to open up. Now, these are, these are, these are the, the durus of the students. These are the durus of the students. In many of the different sciences of Islam, and we'll talk more about that momentarily. As for the durus of the sheikh, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, and he himself mentions in his autobiography that initially he was teaching a Sahih al Musnad, Mimma Lisa Fi Sahihain. A Sahih al Musnad, Mimma Lisa Fi Sahihain. The authentic narrations that are found outside of the Sahihain. But they were, he organized the book as a Musnad. And I'll talk a little bit about what a Musnad is now. Al-Hafid Abu Bakr al-Khatib, rahimahullah ta'ala, he says that a Muslim, as we talk about is now this, the, the term Muslim, the terminology of hadith, he says, Al-Muslim in the Ahl al-Hadith, wa tasal snaduhu ila muntaha. It is the narration that has a connected chain all the way from the narrator to the end of that chain of transmission. So from the very first person who says قَالَ أَوْ حَدَّثَنَا وَأَخْبَرَنَا The very first person to the last person in that chain, that is what is considered a musnad, as long as it's connected. Meaning every narrator heard from the person he is relating from. That is a musnad as it relates to the isnad. And then of course, Ikhwan, we have a kitab musnad. A kitab that is a musnad. And that is a book that is written by the Asma Sahaba. That is a book that is organized and structured according to the names of companions. So, for example, if you have the Musnad of Abi Bakr, the Musnad of Abi Bakr, and that would mean that every narration that one can find, that one can collect from Abu Bakr, would be under that particular chapter, that section under the section of Abu Bakr. Now, it may be in any topic or any subject. So one narration may be, for example, on Hajj, and another narration may, for example, Ikhwan be on yani, marriage. Another narration, for example, may be on yani, prayer. Another narration may be on something that deals with the affairs of creed or like this. But the point is Ikhwan that is based and organized according to the name of a companion. For example, Abu Huraira, who have his Musnad, the narrations that he collects, it could be on any topic or subject. And you may have not only by individual companions, when you may have it organized according to groups of companions. So the Ten Companions Promise Jannah, for example, they'll have their Musnad. And then the companions from the Ansar will have their Musnad, for example. So this is how a book, when a book is called Al Musnad, this is what is intended. So the Shaykh, he organized this book, this first book that he's talking about that he was teaching, as Sahih Al Musnad, Min Malaysa Fi Sahihain, this authentic Musnad of narrations that cannot be found in the two books of Bukhari and Muslim, but that are on the level of authenticity. Now, initially, the Shaykh would teach that before Dhuhr. The Shaykh would normally teach that before Dhuhr. However, in my days, when I was there, the Sheikh was not teaching that particular lesson, and the book had changed. At that point, it was Al Jamir Sahih, Min Malaysa Fi Sahihain. And I'll talk a little bit more about this momentarily. This book actually comes from his Musnad. So remember now, he structured that Musnad according to the names of companions. But again, it could be on, this narrations could be on any topic or any subject. So for the new student of knowledge, it's not easy to search through a Muslim, if you understand what I'm saying. 
For example, now if I'm looking for a hadith on Hajj, and I go to Sahih Bukhari, where do I go to find a narration on Hajj? Let's go to Kitab al Hajj. I go to the book of Hajj. It's a pretty easy research technique. You go to the, the, the book and then you look through the chapter headings. Now, if I'm looking for a narration on Hajj in the Muslim of Ibn Ahmed, where do I go? Right. <laughs> it could be anywhere. So we see, Ikhwan, the distinction here now between a Muslim and a, a Jamia. I'm talking a bit more about a Jamia momentarily. Be patient. So from this Muslim, a Sahih al Muslim, the Shaykh decided to make it easier on the general population, the general body, even of younger or beginning students. And so he took from that a Sahih al Muslim and he wrote his book, Al Jamia Sahih. Remember, he said, Sahih. And at that point, Ikhwan, as I said when I was there, that was the book that we were studying before Al-Dhuhr, right before Al-Dhuhr. Regarding that book, Ikhwan, Al-Jamil Sahih min Malaysa fi Sahihain, the Shaykh said, فَإِنِّي أَحْمَدَ اللَّهِ إِلَّذِي يَسَّرَ لِي سُبَلَ الْعَلِمِ Indeed, I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who made it easy for me, facilitated for me the path of knowledge, of seeking knowledge. And may the books of Sunnah, the pure books of Sunnah, be loved to me. Those books that whoever claims to them will be successful. And whoever turns away from them will stumble and go astray. So here we see a khuala bin Ithikum in this introduction, the shaykh is praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for making it easy for him to seek knowledge in this regard and making that sunnah, those books of the sunnah beloved to them. وَإِنِّي أَحْمَدَ اللَّهِ سُبْحَانُهُ وَتَعَالَىٰ عَلَىٰ مَا يَسَّلَ لِي مِنَ الدَّعْوَ لِلسُنَّةِ النَّبَوِيَةِ بِالْقَلَمِ وَالْلِسَانِ and then he says, and I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for making it easy for me, facilitating for me the call to the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa by the pen and by the tongue. By the pen and by the tongue. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the Shaykh he says, in a time of a fierce fight with the people of innovation and the enemies of Islam against Ahlul Sunnah, and those people he sent Ikhwan from the people of innovation and the enemies of Islam, they all joined forces together against the people of the Sunnah. The people of the Sunnah Ikhwan catch it from every direction, from every angle Ikhwan. They're fighting and battling. But the Shaykh, he says, if you thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who facilitated for us the da'wah to the Sunnah with the pen and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the tongue, in a time of a fierce battle, a fierce fight against the people of innovation and the enemies of Islam, who join forces against them. So may Allah preserve them, meaning the people of Sunnah, against the plots of the enemies. And may Allah make a way out for them. And the Shaykh continues to say, in the da'wah al sunnah bil Yemen to utabar ayah min ayat Allah. And indeed the call in Yemen, the da'wah in Yemen, of Ahl al-Sunnah, is considered a sign from the signs of Allah. إِذْ لَيْسَ لَهَا نَصِيرٌ وَلَا مُعِينٌ إِلَّا اللَّهُ سُبْحَانُهُ وَتَعَالَى As it has no help, helper, except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the Shaykh, he says, فِي ذَلِكَ الْجَوْءِ الْمُظْلِمِ And in that dark atmosphere, الْمَمْلُوبِ الْأَحْزَانِ وَالْمُكَدِّرَاتِ وَالْقَلَاقِلِ وَالزَّلَازِلِ وَالْمِحْنِ وَالْفِتِنِ يسر الله ولله الحمد تأليف مجموعة من القطب الطيبة أرجو أن ينفع الله بها الإسلام والمسلمين. The Sheikh he says, "In that dark atmosphere, that dark environment, 
filled with sadness and trouble and difficulties and trials and tribulations. Allah facilitated the writing of a number of good works that I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause to make a benefit for Islam and the Muslims. Look what the Shaykh is saying here, Khwan. This is a reminder of Ahl Sunnah. That during the darkest days, with the fiercest fights against the people of innovation, in times of difficulty and hardship and struggle and toil, tribulations, it was the focus upon teaching and calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and authoring works in defense of the sunnah that was a makhraj, that was a way out. So therefore, Ikhwan, when the people ask, how do we do, what is the makhraj for this fitna that we find ourselves in, Ikhwan? It is turning to the book of Allah, it is turning to the sunnah, it is studying the works of hadith, it is studying the tafsir of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is teaching that and learning that and standing firm upon that. That is the way out, Ikhwan, in the darkest of environments. That is Ikhwan, what aided the spread of the Dawah Salafiyya in Yemen from, from the Mag all the way down, Ikhwan, to Aden and beyond. It was that focus Ikhwan, upon the call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah facilitated to make easy for our shaykh. Wa inni ahmad Allah qad ra'aytu nafa'a ma kharaja minha and I praise Allah for witnessing the benefit that came from them. Those books, those works. Wa hadha huwa alladhi yuhawwan alayna al-masail and it's that which makes these calamities easier to handle, easier to take. Because he's focusing right now on the call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Seeing that the books are bringing about some benefit, that there are people out there who are benefiting. Not focusing on the negative, accentuating the positive. Looking and seeing that there are shabab, there are youth out there who are reading the works, memorizing the works, adhering to the works, striving and struggling upon that which they are learning. That is why it was an inspiration for the shit, and it helped them, it made it easier to go through the trials and the tribulations. So when we look around and we see Iqwan, the sea of tribulation around us, and the fitna of the Isbis, Iqwan, and all that they have done, Iqwan, and all they continue to do, in waging war against Ahl Sunnah and Jama'ah, in lying and slandering, falsely accusing the people of Sunnah, all of the affairs that they have done, Iqwan, and continue to do, with that ikhwan, we look around and we see the khair that Allah has given us in the light of this masjid tonight. And wallahi ikhwan, it makes the calamities much easier to handle. As we see from the noble statement of our shaykh, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. He says, ikhwan, bal yaj'alana la na'abahu laha. Rather, he says, ikhwan, it allows us not to pay attention to those calamities. Nor resign ourselves to them. We're not going to resign ourselves to what goes on around us, these calamities. We're going to focus on the call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we're going to have sabr. And this call takes sabr, ya akhwan. As the shaykh, he advised us. In his advice to the students of knowledge. As sabr ala tahseel al-ilm. Patience upon obtaining knowledge. And reprising one's knowledge, and preserving one's knowledge, and conveying one's knowledge. One must have patience. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He mentioned the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have made from them imams guiding by our command when they were patient. So a result, Ikhwan, of that patience is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made from those people who were patient, made from among them, Ikhwan, imams, leaders. One cannot be a true leader of the people, a true student, a true call, Ikhwan, except by way of sabr. The one who does not have sabr, Ikhwan, he cannot let alone be a leader, Ikhwan, he can't see knowledge, he can't benefit from knowledge. As the Shaykh used to constantly say, Ikhwan, this ilm takes sabr, it takes patience. 
One may struggle in Quran with that which they need to provide for themselves and their family so they can learn the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It takes sabr. Memorizing and reviewing your information takes sabr and it takes patience. Knowledge does not come in Quran in a single city. Knowledge is by sabr, by repetition, by patience, by ikhlas. And after that Ikhwan, we hope to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to aid us and benefit us in that regard. And in the Shaykh said after this Ikhwan, and in the Nabi Wasallam, of sabr al He mentioned the narration of the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that patience is an illumination. Patience is an illumination, ya Ikhwan. And then he mentioned the statement of Yahya ibn Abi Kathir, the waladihi, that he said to his statement, that to his son, excuse me, the knowledge will not be obtained while you are comfortable. And the mentioned the statement of one of Abdullah ibn Umar, Shukran Shaykh Mughal mentioned it, Tell the student of knowledge to take shoes made of iron. Let him prepare for himself some shoes made of iron, as this is what it's going to take, Ikhwan, for the one who goes in the path of knowledge. And in some words, Ikhwan says, and let him walk in those shoes until they rust. That's the path of seeking knowledge and the patience that it takes Ikhwan to learn in the deal of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah grant us success. So the Shaykh says, we do not resign ourselves to those calamities and what that sea of tribulation around us. And from those works, was the book that we initially mentioned, Ikhwan, that authentic Muslim, as we said, organized according to the names of companions. And he said at that time the book had been sent for publication. But after I sent it off for publication, I thought to myself that I should organize a, a different book from that, based off of that book, based on chapters of fiqh. Again, that goes back to again, making it easier, as we'll see now, for the student of knowledge, the Sheikh says. فَرُبَّمَا لَا يَسْتَفِيدْ مِنَ صَحِيحَ الْمُسْلِمْ مِمَّا لَيْسَ فِي صَحِيحَيْنِ إِلَّا الْمُتَخَصِّصُونَ فِي عِلْمَ الْحَدِيثِ because perhaps the only one who could benefit from that Sahih al Muslim is someone who is a specialist in the science of hadith. So then Shaykh said after this, al Muratan Alladi wa al Abwab al Fiqhiya, the Yastafir Minhu, insha'Allah, al Mutahassis, the Ibn al Hadith, wa Ayyuhu. So the Shaykh said, and therefore, the one who reads from that work that is organized upon the chapters of fiqh, and his salah, shiyam, tahara, he got to the end of that. The one who, went, who reads from that book, perhaps he will benefit from it whether he is a specialist in the science of hadith or not. And that goes back to the Quran again showing the great care and concern of the shaykh. Here the shaykh has written this one book, <coughs> tremendous book, sends it off for publication and he thinks to himself about all of the students who may not be able to benefit from that book what can we do for them? And the Shaykh takes from his time to author another work in Quran to aid those who are not upon that level. And it shows us in Quran that students study according to their level. Students have to study according to their level. No one walks in the Quran and just starts like the Fikun in Al Fi al Numalik. One starts at Al Al Rumiya, for example. Like the Fikun. So this is ilm comes by tadarruj, ikhwan, step by step, stage by stage, learning ikhwan, and that is how the knowledge comes. And as it is said, ikhwan, the knowledge that comes with jumla, yet have been jumla. Knowledge that comes at once, goes at once. Anyone who's trying to memorize a whole bunch of stuff just for like a test, they can attest to the fact that after they pass or whatever happens to that test, a week later they forget, forgot much of what they memorized. So it comes to Quran in stages, in degrees, patience, as we said, repetition over and over again, according to your level, according to one's level. 
And so the Shaykh said that this, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he said, I began the Kitab al Ilm, I started with the Book of Knowledge, Iqtida' al Bil Quran al Kareem. Starting with what I found in the Book of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Why do you think the Shaykh said that? He said, I started the first book in his Al Jam al Sahih, Bin Malaysa fi Sahihain, those authentic narrations based on chapters of fiqh that are not found in the two Sahihs of Bukhari and Muslim. He said he started with the book of knowledge following after the Quran. What does he mean by that? Huh? Hey, okay. Who said it first? You said it first. Ah, play you. Now, the Shaykh, he says, the Quran that is based on the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, iqra bisbiratika alladhi khala. Read in the name of your Lord who created to the end of that. Hada wa qad iqtadaytu fi tarajim bi imam hadi sana'ah. And he says, as for the chaptering, the chaptering, the organization of the chapters of the book, then I follow the imam of the science. And who does he mean here? Imam al Bukhari. Imam al Bukhari? You got one too? We'll be the next one. I'll be the next one. Now, who would be an Imam al Bukhari? The Imam of the science, he says, Imam al Bukhari. So, this Nikwan is that work, as we said, that is organized according to chapters of Fiqh. And the different narrations that, are, that cannot be found in the Sahih of Bukhari and Muslim. Now, one of the reasons why the Shaykh, one of the things that prompted the Shaykh to write this particular work, and he talks about this in his life story as well, that one of his teachers, Ikhwan, wrote a book, basically started stating or arguing that we stop at the Quran and the two Sahihs. We stop at the Quran and the two Sahihs of Bukhari and Muslim. And the Shaykh, he said, when I heard that from my teacher there, he said, well, I, that thing was Yani Munkar. It came to my mind when I first heard it from him that it was Munkar. Did not accept that. And he said, and as I began, of course, to study, and then later on began to compile these works of those narrations that are outside of the two sides of Bukhari and Muslim, he said, it only increased me in certainty of the error of that teacher. I like it if you will. After Salaam al-Duhur, ya Quran, we study from Tafsir ibn Kathir. After Al-Duhar, we study from Tafsir ibn Kathir. The Shaykh was asked, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, about studying this Tafsir, yani, Tafsir ibn Kathir. And the question was, Kay for Yum in Tadris, Tafsir ibn Kathir, Al Qira'a, Ma'adim al Ta'akud, Mila Hadith, Wahal Yum in Qira'a to Hu Alim Nasirda. So the question says, is it possible to study this tafsir in the Kathir and to read from it without certainty as it relates to the authenticity of some of the narrations that can be found in it? The second part of the question, the tag question is, and is it possible to read to the people sort of page by page, like this? So the Shaykh, he says, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he answered, Mumkin, this is of course possible, yes. And he said that a number of our brothers have taken up the task to do a tahid, a checking of Ibn Kathir. And I mentioned yesterday to you, Ikhwan, something of that. There was a research team that was put together uh, in doing this checking of Ibn Kathir. And the Shaykh, he said, at that particular time, and they had finished three juz up into Surah Al-Anfal. Well, I believe you meaning volumes, exact, meaning volumes up into Surah Al-Anfal. Well, back in Asallah, and Yahdiyahum, Masha Ikhwan and Abi Bukh, bin Zaman, or Illa Yom Kin Yakun Kadharja Kulla. He says, May Allah, and he guide them like this. Our brothers have, and he moves slow as he relates to the word. <laughs> he said, otherwise it would have been possible to complete the whole of it. <laughs> the Shaykh continues, if one says, nah, mumkin, taqra'a al-nas. Of course, yes, one can read 
this book to the people. وَإِذَا مَرَّ بِكَ حَدِيثٌ وَمَا قَالَ أَخْرَجُ الْبُخَارِ وَلَا مُسْلِمْ وَلَا صَحَحَهُ هُوَ And if a person comes past the narration, comes by a narration, and it does not say, the narration does not say, for example, collected by Imam al-Bukhari or collected by Muslim or authenticated by Ibn Kathir himself. And this is what the Shaykh he says, who Imam al because he was an Imam al Mujtahid, Ibn Kathir. إِذَا صَحَحَهُ قَبَلْنَاهُ مِنْهُ If he authenticates the narration, we accept it from him. He's an Imam of this affair. Otherwise, if it does not say collected by Bukhari, collected by Muslim, or authenticated by an Imam like Ibn Kathir, the tawakka fi, then we just, we don't say anything. We don't say yay or nay. You can't say it's authentic or weak because you, you have to check it out. You have to find out. And that's what's intended by tawakka fi. You're not saying it's weak, you don't know. You're not saying it's authentic, you don't know. So you're making tawakka until information comes to you. So the Shaykh is allowed to the Sikhwan, وَتَفْسِيرِ الْكَثِيرِ لَيْسِ لَهُ نَذِيرِ فِي التَّفَسِيرِ Ibn Kathir's tafsir does not have an equal as it relates to the Muslim tafsir. فَالشَّوْكَانِ يَقُولُ فِي تَرْجَمَتِهِ So as Shawkani says about Ibn Kathir in his biography of him, وَتَفْسِيرُهُ مِنْ أَحْسَنَ التَّفَسِيرِ إِنْ لَمْ يَكُنْ أَحْسَنُهَا he says that the tafsir of Ibn Kathir is from the best, from the best of the books of tafsir, if not the best. If not the best. Now I mention this ikhwan as a means of saying what? The importance of studying the likes of tafsir Ibn Kathir. It's striving to learn and understand the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know ikhwan that the Quran is explained first and foremost by the Quran. The Quran explains itself. Along with that, of course, along with that, of course, the Sunnah, the Dik Sunnah explains the Quran. And then, of course, that the Sahaba who lived with the Messenger of Allah and learned from him, explained the meaning of the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they took that now directly from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then from the Aqwal al Tabi'een, from the Salaf and the likes of that. And then some of the people of Yani of Ilm have said, the likes of Shaykh al Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah, and even eventually, after going through those different stages, finding the Arabic language, for example. But one does not start with the Arabic language, as we'll see momentarily with the language of Ta'ala. And even we know, Ikhwan, that sometimes a verse will come down in the Arabic language, and the companions are the most knowledgeable of the Arabic language for many other people, and they would have to ask for their seven percent of the meaning of an ayah. Or they would interpret something one way, and the Prophet would have to explain this meaning. And we'll talk something about that momentarily with the legs of God, which are. So Shaykh Mok, when he continues, his Quran, he says, Fanmuhim, had a tafsir adin salafi. This is a salafi tafsir. The tafsir of Ibn Kathir is a salafi tafsir from a salafi scholar that establishes the affairs of salafia. So if one wants to study a salafi tafsir, one looks to the, to, to the tafsir of Ibn Kathir and learns from it and studies it. And the Shaykh says, مَا عَدَاهَا مُمْكِنْ أَنْ يَكُنْ إِمُبْتَدِعْ عَدَامًا He said, what is opposite or outside of that? Perhaps it could be from a person of innovation. We know that there are several works of tafsir that were written by the people of innovation. أَمْرُنْ آخَرَ Another reason. رُبَّ كِتَابٍ يَهْتَمْ بِالنَّحْ Maybe these other books of tafsir that we're talking about, maybe the focus is on grammar. For example, we just talked about that. Alhamdulillah. The Shaykh said, as if the Quran was revealed for just for grammar, right? In other words, in this particular tafsir. And he said, And some of those tafsir, those commentaries, focus on yani, the eloquence of the Quran, those rules of eloquence in the Quran. And he mentions others like Zanakshiri, Alamafihim al Inhiraf. Well, Ba'adhum Yan Tempil Fiqh. And some of the books of Tafsir are focused on affairs of Fiqh, like the Tafsir of Al Qurtubi. Like the Tafsir of Al Qurtubi. Well, Ba'adhul Ayat, 
وبعد آيات الأحكام is some of the آيات dealing with the rulings as we said of fiqh look what the shaykh said after this إخوان لكن هذا التفسير من تفسير إنه كثير جمع هذا وهذا وذاك إبن كثير compiles all it comprises all of that it has from grammar it has from يعني fiqh it has from other than the إخوان لما يفيقهم in this tremendous tafsir, and then the shaykh says, Wallahu al-Musta'an, and reference itself with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this shows us the, Quran, the tremendous nature of studying the likes of tafsir ibn Kathir. And so we would study that after Salat al dhuhr and again the shaykh at that point was not teaching the book, but from his students. And then after the asr, and I'll get to the other classes between that from the students after Salat al dhuhr momentarily. I'm now talking about the main classes of the Shaykh. Rahimah Allah Ta'ala. And that which he passed off from the main classes in the masjid, on the kursi, on the chair. Sahih al-Bukhari. And this was after Salat al-Asr. And regarding this book, Ikhwan, Sahih al-Bukhari, Shaykh al Shaykh Mukbul, he said, إذا فتحت البخاري وقلت قال البخاري أنسى جميع مشاعر الدنيا ومشاكلها. If I open Sahih al-Bukhari, if I open this book and I read, قال الإمام البخاري حدثنا قال الإمام البخاري أخبرنا the Shaykh said I forget all the all of the preoccupations of the dunya and all of its troubles. Think of how much Ikhwan love one must have for the science of hadith. Remember the Shaykh said that he thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for making the books of Sunnah beloved to him. Beloved to him. That it was from the works of the Sunnah Ikhwan that helped him through the days of tribulation and calamity. So here the Shaykh is saying now, Ikhwan, that when he would open Bukhari and read, Qala Imam al Bukhari, he would forget all of the preoccupations of the dunya and all of its troubles. Imagine quite what people do nowadays to try to find some way to get out of tribulation and troubles and worries on their minds. They got all kinds of things in quite from the haram or from things that are wasteful of time. But when now it's become so beloved to you, it becomes that you take that the, the sweetness of of ilm, of knowledge, quite to the point where you open up a book of tafsir, open up a book of hadith, open up a book of fiqh like this, and you get so engrossed in that book, you so now in, 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 in green in that book that you forget all about all of your problems. Those problems just disappear because you're now with the narrations. You're now Ikhwan as if you're walking as we said with those noble companions. So this Ikhwan causes us to forget the dunya and its problems. They asked one of the scholars of the past I believe it was Sufyan Al-Thawri Rahim Allah Ta'ala he said after the Salat you never sit with us. You never sit, you never sit down and spend time with us and talk with us. And the narration he says, What am I gonna do with you? Sit here and backbite the people? I get up and go to my house to be with the companions of the Messenger of Allah. What did he mean by that? By reading in the books of Hadith. That he would find himself in their yani sort of yani environment, reading about them and learning about them as if he was in their presence in Quran of Ifiko. So he said, I don't have time to be sitting here with y'all backbiting the people talking about foolishness. I'm going to be with the companions. I'm going to read the stories and the narrations of the companions. So the Shaykh, he said, he will open Bukhari, he will forget the preoccupation of the dunya and all of his problems. The Shaykh would always start sorry, the class of Sahih Bukhari Yaquan by making the students stand up and recite the narrations of that day. So for example, if the next day we knew we were going to you know, go through what we were in the say Kitab al Nikah, and the next day there were several narrations in that chapter, you would memorize from those narrations, and that next day the Shaykh would make students stand up from different places. Every place would have their day, and you never knew which day was yours. So one day maybe the students from Libya, they got to stand up and recite the narration from memory with the chain, with the chain of narration, not getting away with the method. You got to get the chain of narration and you got to give the metan, the text, the body of the narration as well. It might be the Libyans' term one day, the Egyptians another day. It might be the Jordanians another day, and like this. And normally, when there were short narrations, normally when there were short narrations, that would be the day of the Ayajim. 
That will be the day of the non-Arabs. And just to give you an example, I mean, if you, I told this story many times over the years. I said I would talk a little bit about the humor of the Sheikh Rahimahullah Ta'ala. One of my brothers got married from the Americans. And so we invited the Sheikh to his uh, walima. Sheikh had guests that day. Some people had come in from out, out of, uh, from outside of uh, the Maj. And so the Sheikh initially excused himself. We, you know, we, ah, Sheikh, it's an honor to have you come instead of third. Um, bring the guests, bring your guests, Sheikh, bring your guests. Everybody come over and enjoy it. So the Sheikh, he agreed. Like I said, the Sheikh, the Sheikh loved his students. And he agreed. He was as busy as he is. He took time to come to the Brothers Walima. So, as I mentioned to you before, my beloved companion, Sheikh Hassan al-Sumali was my neighbor. So there were three homes, we had three homes. So my home was on the right, the brother got married, his home was in the middle, and Sheikh Hassan's home was on the end. Our three homes were connected. So my house was the biggest. So the brothers, <laughs> the brothers were in that <laughs> The home in the middle, our brother got married in, that was strictly for the sheikh and his guests. I mean, the sheikh, so people wouldn't bother the sheikh and the likes of that. And Hassan's house, which was the nicest, the sisters were in it. <laughs> I heard people. So after the meal and everything, you know, we finish, the sheikh comes out, he's making dua for the brother. Supplicates for the brother, you know, for his marriage and stuff, you know, he's happy for the brother, they get they're getting land cruises, they're going on back across the line, you know. So the next day in the Bukhari class, it just so happens it's a short narration. Just so happens it's a short narration. So of course it's the day for the Ayajah, for the Westerners and the non-Arabs, it's their day to stand up and recite the narration. So everybody's standing up, they recite the narration. And the Sheikh smiles, and I knew what was happening when he smiled, right? So he calls on the brother. So of course the brother just got married and stuff. He ain't memorized anything. <laughs> he memorized a thing. So he's behind the, the, the pillar. And then I'm actually, he's got the book and he's, you know, he's scrambling trying to hurry up and memorize the narration, right? So Jesus he calls his name a couple of times, so the brother's still scrambling. So I told on him. I said, yeah, Sheikh, how who was that? Most definitely, uh, he's hiding. So the brother stands up, so he's, he's struggling there quiet. Calling him up on Bukhari. He's clearly stupid. So he doesn't get through a narrator. So the Sheikh, Sheikh laughs. Sheikh's laughing the whole time. He's laughing the whole time. He said, Yeah, Khwah. He said, Now, now, yeah, Khwah. And uh, he said, Indeed, now it's just lost between the. the yeah. I don't really have a lot of people. It was, a, everybody laughed, it was tremendous and quiet. But the point of the shahid is that those short narrations, they were for the, yani for the students from the West in particular. And the Shaykh Ikhwan along with that, let me just make the point here as it relates to the Ayajim, our brothers from the West. He encouraged the brothers to learn the Arabic language, to focus on the Arabic language as much as possible. And he says, for example, Ikhwan, he advised the students of knowledge and ta'afu to take from the Arabic language that which will straighten your tongue. And that you'll be able to learn the meanings of the different things in the Quran and the Hadith and the likes of this. But another advice he gave Ikhwan, that which we advised the student of knowledge who loves the Sunnah. Of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and Ya'khud min al-Lughas al-Arabiyya when he's taqeen bihi lisanuhu that he learns from the Arabic language that which will straighten his tongue of course what we mean by straighten his tongue he'll be able to read and understand that which he has before him and then he mentioned the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Qur'an al-Arabiyya na ghayda di iwaj in the Arabic Qur'an Qur'an is the Arabic language in the Arabic Qur'an with no crookedness within it. So the Quran and the Sunnah of the Shaykh says are Arabiya. They are Arabic. Now the Shaykh Ikhwan Abdul Fikum, what he would do 
In these instances, is he, as I told you, he loved his students. And he would make sure that someone was looking out for the students. So I remember one day in class, when he called on me and asked me a question, and after finishing the question, before she got his life, he said, continue to stand, he said, are you helping your brothers with Arabic? So of course I made all kinds of excuses, like, oh, shit, I'm busy, I'm studying, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, shit, says, lie. He said, you teach your brothers, you benefit your brothers, you aid your brothers. He mentioned the narration of the Prophet said to them, that Allah will aid his slave, his servant, as long as his servant aids his brother. So the next day, alhamdulillah, we opened the lesson in Yani Nah. But the Shahid is, he had great concern as it relates to the study of the Arabic language from a Nah, a Sarf, and other than that. Who here studies Sarf? Who has studied the Sarf? Nobody. I see you, you, you doing this. This, this, huh? Tell you. Have you studied Al Qalb al Makani? Al Qalb al Makani. Tell you that. In Sarf, Sarf the Quran is, for those who are not aware, it is morphology. We say morphology in the, in, in the English language, in the, the term. And it is the science of the structure of words, how words are structured, and you know, put together. And many of you have seen the awzan, those scales, fa'ala, 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 like that, right? So those are the scales in, in Sarf. And so, again, Sarf sort of deals with how those words are, again, organized and how the letters come in order and like this. So in Sarf there is this affair called Al-Qalb Al-Makani, and it's when letters ha actually have to be switched, the places of letters have to be switched from one place to another. So for example, we have what's called Ism Fa'il, Ism Fa'il, and that is of course in the you know, subjective, the subjective. So this is someone who's doing an action. It's someone who's doing an action. So for example, who give an example of uh, Islam Fari? Hmm? Huh? La, Islam Fari. Qatil. Come on, it's not easy. Qatil. Some, 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 some. Qatil. So qatil is on the scale of fa'il, right? So we have the qaf, which is the fa of the kalima, that will take the place of the fa of the kalima, fa'il, qatil, qaf, fa, and of course the alif, right? And then we have the ta, which is the ayn of the kalima, right? Ta, ayn, kalima, qat, qat, fa. And then we have the lamb, which is the lamb of the kalima, right? Which is that last letter, fa'il, qatil. But there are certain instances that find because of rules in the Arabic language where letters actually have to be switched around. So for example, the verb ja'a. The verb ja'a in, in, in the Arabic language, which means he came or he's come. The ism fa'il is not on the version of fa'il. It's actually on the version of fa'lir. Lam ayn. You have to switch the places of those last two letters because the asl is Fa, uh, excuse me, Jim, Ya, Hamza. And we know we find that in Sarf, when that middle letter is either a Wow or a Ya, that sometimes it switches to a Hamza. So if you were to try to do the Ism Fa'il like that, it would be Ja'il. You have two Hamzas that would meet, and it's not permissible for two Hamzas to meet in the Arabic language. So something got to be done. So when you switch that to that Ya, you switch the places. And it becomes fa'li, it becomes uh, ja'i, ala wazni fa'li, as opposed to fa'li. That's called al qalb al makan. And one of the ways that they actually teach you the Quran when they teach Sarf, they mention that young children do this a lot. They, they switch up letters when they say things. So they might say, for example, yani, uh, uh, Yusuf, they say Yufus. They'll switch those letters up. They're children. But that is actually an example they give in Sarf of Qalb al-Makan, Qalb al-Makan, switching up the letters. 
So he would advise us to study not only not, not only grammar, but sarf as well. But sarf as well. And other than that, of course, in the Arabic language, that which would be sufficient for a student to understand that which he is learning. And also, as we talked about that memorization and reciting those narrations in Bukhari, the Sheikh also gave some advice as it relates to memorization. And I said I would talk about this as well. He says, I advise my brothers for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with reading and writing if they have the ability to write and like this. This goes back to what I mentioned earlier about memorizing the Quran. Remember I said in ayah, recite it three or four times, and then you do the second one over and over. You know what the Sheikh says? And for those of you who desire to memorize, then you should write the hadith once or twice or three times. Just keep writing it. You just keep writing it over and over again. It's why repetition, I'm telling you, it works. And when I should teach my students, some of them are here, I should teach them Arabic language, they should get angry with me. They would be studying the book, uh, the book of uh, the Medina program, and I would make them copy the chapter how many times? 25 times. He remembers. <laughs> You have to, yeah, that's what they, that was their homework. You have to write the chapter out 25 times. And the next day it starts all over again. But what that does, Ikhwan, is after you've written the first half of the book 100 times, <laughs> you pretty much can sell it from memory. You can tell somebody in the book from memory for the most part. That repetition. So the sheikh is saying, hey, Ikhwan, you want to memorize? Just keep writing the thing over and over and over again. And you can do that with the Quran as well. I mean, if you Write the ayah over and over and over again. Recite it again over and over and over again. Until it wind again, as the Sheikh mentions here, it is planted firmly in your mind. Repetition, it wind is a tremendous method of memorization. After the, oh, before we move on to that, it wind up this is important. The Sheikh used to read in the lesson, he would read first the Isnad, he would read the chain of narration, we had So the Shaykh would read himself. Now I know in many instances we see someone reading for the, the Shuyukh, but in my recollection in my days, in the manner of the Shaykh, the Shaykh read himself from his book. And after reading the chain of narration, as I said in one, he would go narrator by narrator. And he would mention a benefit related to that narrator. And it could be a benefit, as I like said, it could be dealing with his biography, his students, his teachers, who he narrates from, and the likes of that. And what the scholars of Hadith have said regarding him. And then after going through the chain of narration, he would go into the into the metin, the body itself, and make some explanations and some commentary on some of the meanings of the narration and the likes of this, and sometimes we would do monakasha. The shape would kind of go back and forth, the students make the students stand up, and they would go back and forth on different issues. And as I said, the Quran, the shape read himself during those days. After the Bukhari class, was the time when the shape went for his walk. He would go out and he would walk through the wadi. And this was almost like a time of exercise and he just sort of uh, going out into the into the wadi, into the valley. And in my time at the magic one, I never missed a day of walking with the sheikh. If the sheikh went on his walk, I was with him. And I, I don't say that Ikhwan as some means of bragging. I say that to say Ikhwan that I wanted the match to be with Sheikh Mokla and I wanted to be with him as much as possible. So when he went out on those walks, the Quran, I would go out with him every day. Rahimahullah ta'ala. I don't know several other students who would go, not, not a lot, but several other students who would go on those walks. And it was during those walks, the Quran, where I benefited tremendously. And I talk about one of those moments momentarily, the delights of Allah ta'ala. 
But this walking, as we said, was a means of exercise. It was something the Sheikh would do for exercise. And I read a very tremendous benefit, Ikhwan, in, in one of the books of, of Tib, of prophetic medicines, and the life of this, and it says, And remember earlier we talked about preserving your time and your health. Of course, eating well is part of trying to preserve your health and also being active. And so as I mentioned here in this book of Tib, Ikhwan, that yeah, the haraka movement, exercise, activity is from the strongest means of the preservation of one's health. It makes the body lighter and more energetic. You exercise, you actually gain energy from that. The body becomes used to moving. And then the book mentions what a you al kathrat riyadatuhu qawiya wa nashat. That any body part that you move a lot and you exercise a lot becomes stronger and more energetic. And the Sheikh would take these moments after the class, and we said after the Asr class, Ikhwan, after the Bukhari class, to walk the Wadi. But he would also, Ikhwan, receive a lot of people from the different tribes and the likes of this who would come to him at that time. This is when the common folk would come in just to ask general questions. And you might have a, a person come ask about you know, you know, you know, about suckling, about how, I mean, how you name it. People will come with all kinds of family issues. You will see the Sheikh sometimes settle disputes between people out there in that wadi. It was an amazing thing to witness Ikhwan, rahimahullah ta'ala. And he would answer those people's questions with patience and forbearance. I never saw him get angry. I never saw him yell at anybody. I never saw him you know, he become harsh with anybody out in the wadi from the common folk. Patient, forbearing, teaching and educating the people, rahimahullah ta'ala. As I said, the Quran, we used to benefit on these walks with the shaykh, and I would take the opportunity that if I was doing a, you know, a personal or private research, that I would read something on the shaykh and ask him questions. And in one instance, the Quran, I came across a narration. And the narration in the chain, one of the narrators was trustworthy and sound unless he narrated on someone from Sham. Unless he narrated on somebody from Sham. If he narrated on somebody from Sham, he had problems. Now again, that shows the precision of the scholars of Hadith. Well, this particular chain that I, I was reading, he narrated on a Sun'ani. A Sun'ani. Not Abdul Razak al Sun'ani, a Sun'ani, right? Someone a Sun'ani. So on face value, I'm like, okay, Sun'ani, from Yemen, so send out the chain of sound. But as we were kind of taught in Ba'ath and research that you have to go through each narrator and look at their entire biography. You just can't take at face value what you see as you read in the chain. So as I go back through each narrator, I look and I discover, oh, wait a minute. لا صنعاء اليمن بل من صنعاء الشام قرية بباب دمشق. He was from Sanaa, not the Sanaa in Yemen, but a place called Sanaa that was outside of Damascus, which is where in Sham. So like, Subhanallah, this changes the, the whole picture. The problem is, as I'm looking through the different tahqiqat of, of the work, no one's mentioning it. So, I'm, of course, the first thing I think is I'm making some mistake, right? You have to, of course, if one, the person should not have you know, I mean, the kind of thought about themselves when they puffed up that they, they know better than, you know, than the dunya. So, I'm thinking to myself, okay, there's something I'm missing, there's something I'm not catching with. So, on one of those walks after Shah so Asr, after the, the class in Bukhari, I read the chains of the Sheikh, I told the Sheikh what I had discovered, and I said to the Sheikh, I said, Sheikh, however, I did not discover some of the tahqiqat and the shaykh said, Ya Malik, ha'ulai to job. He said, I know people are just merchants. In other words, they're not concerned, they don't care about those kinds of details. They're not, the people that they have on their team, research team, they're, like, they're not necessarily going to be looking at that kind of detail for things, necessarily. And therefore, the shaykh, he mentioned to me that indeed what I found was correct. And that is an example, Ikhwan, of the kinds of things that we would be able to benefit from on those moments of walking with the shaykh there. And the wadi along with again, as we said, the Quran getting that, that great exercise and activity. 
that taught me also, Ikhwan, the importance of the ijtihad, as we said in back in the research, and again, not looking at things on a surface level. That is important for us, Ikhwan, to study and research and look around. Because unfortunately, Ikhwan, what happens is a person may read something in one text, in one book, and believe that they have, they have all knowledge. They, what they have learned is sufficient. But Ikhwan, when you go through one text, and you go through another text, and you look at what the scholars have said regarding that, and you continue to research and, 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 and dig into the text, you gain more benefit. In the general of the Nusus, you gather together all of the wordings that Shaykh Abdul Mashal Abad mentions in his explanation of the Hadith of Jibreel. You gather together all of the different wordings so that you can gain a fuller picture. In one, one, in one wording, in one narration of the Hadith of Jibreel, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sitting on an elevated mound, or like this, off of the earth. And Shaykh Abdul, Abdul Mashal mentions so that it's easier for the people to see him from those who are not close to him. That's something you benefit in one word that you don't find another word. Now you bring all of those words together that you get a fuller picture of what's going on in, in, in the north, in the narration. So this is what is intended to find by not limiting yourself to thinking that you've read a particular book that's halash, like him on the subject. One Ikhwan should not have that kind of thought about themselves. Humility Ikhwan. Between al maghrib and Isha Ikhwan, it was time for the Sahih of Imam Muslim. Between Maghrib and Isha Al-Qur'an was the time for Sahih Muslim. And the Shaykh, of course, would read and study from their work in a similar fashion to Sahih al-Bukhari. And one thing I forgot I wanted to mention about Sahih al-Bukhari, I was present in the match when the Shaykh finished Sahih al-Bukhari after 10 years. After 10 years of studying the book, the Shaykh finished, let's say he finished on a Wednesday, on Thursday, he was right back at the beginning of the book. Started the very next day right back from the beginning of the book. Rahim al-Wabta. Again, repetition, studying it over and over and over again. And also along with it, Ikhwan, during between Mother and Isha, he also we also read a study from the book Mustadrik, Al Hakim. The book of Al Hakim in which Ikhwan and Mustadrik al Sahihain, the book in which he and Hakim set out to collect the narrations that were authentic, that were not found in the Sahihs of Bukhari and Muslim, that he says were upon their conditions. However, when there are many narrations that are weak, extremely weak, in this particular book, and to the point where Imam al-Dahabi said, If only he had written the book. He said, Al-Dahabi said, فَإِنَّهُ غَضَّ عَنْ فَضَائِلِهِ بِسُوءِ تَصَرُّفِهِ because it sort of diminished his virtues, this, I mean, this statement sort of diminished his virtues based on that performance of that which was found in that, that work, that book. And to the point that was some of the people of the past said that there was not a narration in there on the conditions of Bukhari and Muslim. Whoever Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani responds to that and refutes that and says that neither are narrations in there, there are upon the conditions of Bukhari and Muslim. Shaykh Rashid Mukhtar said that perhaps the problem with the book, or the reason for the book, is that Al Hakim originally wrote the book and was planning to go back and revise it, but died before he had a chance to do so. So perhaps that's what happened. He wrote the book, like we said, the first draft, basically. He wrote the book in a first draft, basically, and perhaps he wanted to go back and he wanted to work on it, revise it, exchange narrations and the likes of that, take out narrations, add narrations, but he passed before he had an ability to do so. And therefore, the book we have before us is what we have, and Allah knows best. Also, Ikhwan, oh, the Shaykh, and by the way, the Shaykh, he wrote a study not only of Al Hakim, but also he wrote a tremendous book in the narrators of the Jal Al Hakim, the narrators of Al Hakim. And this is important. When you're studying in Hadith, many of the works of the Jal, for example, many of them, Yani yeah, have the narratives of the Qutb al-Sitta. So for example, Tahdib al-Kamal, Tahdib al-Tahdib, 
these works, Ibn Hajar and al Mizzi, these works, Ikhwan, deal with the narrators of the Qutb al Sitta. But what happens, Ikhwan, of those scholars who collect, collected works after them? Right? So then there were narrators who came after them, which means that the chains are longer. So people need to come along and sort of collect the, the biographies and clarify the biographies of those scholars who came after those who came after the Qutb al Sitta. So the Shaykh wrote a book regarding the Rijal of Adar al for example, and the Rijal of Hakim, in those narrators who cannot necessarily be found in the Qutb al Sitta. Right? And as it relates to that, Ikhwan the Shaykh was asked, what is one of the best books to study and research those kind of narrators? And the Shaykh said, Tariq al Islam by Al Dahabi. Tariq al Islam by Al Dahabi. Also, Ikhwan, between Al Maghrib and Isha, we would read Al Sahih al Musnad min Dala al Nubuwa. The authentic Musnad, again, the Musnad, we are talking about what a Musnad is. From proofs of prophethood. From proofs of prophethood. Well, call the Shaykh, and the Shaykh said regarding this Ikhwan, regarding studying the likes of this book, for in the dirasa, that studying the proofs of prophethood increases a believer in faith. Because now you're reading these narrations where the Messenger of Allah, for example, is mentioning things that can only be, be known by way of revelation. Mentioning, for example, the, the splitting of the Ummah into 73 different sects, for example. Or narrations from the signs of the hour, the disappearance of the scholars, and the likes of this, that can only come by way of revelation. These are proofs of prophet, the things that the Prophet ﷺ said would come to pass, that are coming to pass and will come to pass. These are proofs of prophethood. That increase, increases the believer in faith. He said it had to come by way of revelation. He couldn't have just known that. He had to, that had to come by way of revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So studying a book like that increases a person, a believer in faith. And in the Shaykh said after the Shaykh, وَرُبَّمَا كَانَتْ سَبَبًا لِلْإِسْلَامِ مَنْ يُرِيدُ اللَّهِ بِهِ خَيْرًا And perhaps it will be the cause or the means of guiding someone to an Islam who Allah intends good for them. So these words, Ikhwan, the likes of Dilal and Nabuwa, the proofs of prophethood, are tremendously important. And so the Shaykh, he authored this book in that regard. And other scholars of the past have written books like this, Ikhwan, in the likes of uh, Al-Bayhaqi. Al-Bayhaqi. From Al-Bayhaqi, and of the Ikhwan, and regarding this, by the way, Ikhwan al Bihaqi, he said, Al Qasd min Had al Kitab, in the writing or the authoring of his book, Dila al Nubuwa, he said, The purpose of this book, Bayan Dila al Nubuwatihi, the clarification of the proofs of his prophethood, Wa Alam Shidqihi, Yirisalatihi, and the signs of the truthfulness of his message. Who knows the scholar Al Bihaqi? What was his name? No <laughs> Ahmed ibn al Hussein Abu Bakr. Ahmed ibn al Hussein Abu Bakr. Also, the choir between Mughal ibn Isha, Al Jami al Sahih, Fil Qadr, the Shaykh's book. The authentic narrations on the topic of the divine decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Shaykh said regarding this work, وسميته الجامع صحيح في القدر 
He said, after يعني, refuting the likes of the Rafiullah and the Vendor and Mikwan in the introduction of his work, the Shaykh says, and indeed we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed good and bad. So I sought Allah's help in compiling Quranic verses, and prophetic traditions, and the statements of some of the scholars, the Imams of Islam, of the Muslims. In this work, and I titled it Al Jamir Sahih Fil Qadr. And those were the works in Quran, and there were other smaller works from time to time. If one book was finished, the Sheikh may start another smaller work. A lot of this I remember, we were doing for a time. So there were these other smaller works that he would do, but those were the main lessons of the Sheikh. Those are the main lessons of the Sheikh. And then the Sheikh, he says himself, Amma Ikhwani Fil as for my brothers in Islam, my brothers for the sake of Allah, for in whom Qa'imun be the rules, the Ikhwari and Vijini and Bajarat and Ilmiya, and Mustawiyat and Tullah. The Shaykh says, For indeed they establish lessons for their brothers in all of the different areas of knowledge according to the level of the students. According to the level of the students, I've talked a lot about that tonight, Ikhwan. In the Tawheed. And from the works of of course, if you will study Kitab al Tawheed, Fatih al Majid, you will find students that open classes in Kitab al Tawheed often. In Fatih al Majid, often. You will find, for example, students who, for the newer students or the younger students or even from the Western students, the Surah Talatha, for example, some of the likes of these kinds of works that one would study in Tawheed and the likes of this. Wal-Aqeedah. And again, you will find in Wasitiyah, another them that Ikhwan being taught amongst the students. Wal-Fiqh, wa-Usulihi, wal-Hadith, wa-Usulihi. Fiqh and its fundamentals, and Hadith and its fundamentals. And from the works of fiqh, uh, from the works of hadith, ikhwal al a student may start with al baykhuniya Does anybody study al baykhuniya You remember I asked They would study al baykhuniya with, with his memorization, with his memorization. And also ikhwal al-Nukhmat al-Fikr, by Ibn Hajar, and Nusrat al nadhar his explanation of al-Nukhmat al-Fikr as well. And al al Hadith. Now, the beauty of studying with the students, Ikhwan, is that students are always opening up similar classes. So, what would happen is, for example, I would finish al al Hadith, right? Musala Hadith, Hadith terminology. And I would find out a week later another student had opened up another class in al Ba'ith. So, because I wanted to be Mutamekin in that book, I would go and sit in that other dust as well. So that's what you will find, Ikhwan, and, and as we'll see in a moment, the classes were everywhere, all over. Now you, if you walk through Ikhwan, the classes were literally everywhere around you. Circles of knowledge. Every part of the island, there's a circles of knowledge all around you. Different stuff going on. There would be announcements, who were teaching what, what classes were opening. It was an amazing thing. In al Faraid. In the knowledge of the sciences of inheritance, when not grammar, when chutz, handwriting. I said in a couple of handwriting classes, when in lie, dictation, which a student of knowledge needs, by the way, to take good notes, a student needs to know how to, to take dictation well and knows how to write the letters properly. So, where does the humza go? When it's over an hour, over a while, like that, right? So, they know how to write the humza. As it moves, as it is in different places in the letter, the affair that we talked about before, all of that is connected to Imla, and other than that. And the Sheikh he says, "What you need, ma yahtaj you need the talib, the ulum al diniyah, and all of that which is due to these to learn the affairs and the sciences of the religion." But what's that in the heart? And this means, and I wanted to mention something here, Juan, that this was not specific to the men. I don't want anybody to get the impression that just the brothers 
the women had their lessons as well. And they were learning as well. Our wives and daughters, whoever was there from the women, were also learning. Like, but they had their lessons and their classes as well amongst the, the sisters. And about this Ikhwan, the Sheikh, he advised the women. He said, Ansahaki, Ansahuki, and to Nabdi Miwaktaki, I advise you to manage your time well. This is to our sisters. And to make some time for seeking knowledge. To so make from your time, or take from your time to seek knowledge. And to study beneficial works. Like Riyadh al-Salihin. Coral and pearls of the narrations agreed upon by Bukhari and Muslim. And also he mentions the study of Tatsun Majid, Shah Kitab al Tawheed for the women. Now, of course, according to everyone's level of uh, and ability. But the shahid of the point, the highlighting point from this is the Shaykh's encouragement for the women to study as well. And the Shaykh, the Quran, used to take time to teach his daughter, who was a teacher there, who taught the women, as we mentioned before, as a writer and what have you. He would take him the time to teach her as well. And he focused not only on the teaching of the men, but the teaching of the women as well. And in the Shaykh, he said that this, Rahim Allah Ta'ala, with the dhaq al-mashjid, with sakinat, the filwadi, tahta ashjab. Subhanallah. And the Shaykh said, if the masjid became too, too restrict, constricted, there wasn't enough room, and the people took it out to the wadi. Not only is it a wadi, Iqwan, I remember I, I did a class of al-mutimima and not on the roof of the masjid. And on the roof of the masjid, there were different halakat up on the roof. So you had different circles on the roof and you had circles in the wadi, you had circles in the, in the single section. Brothers might be sitting down in front of their, their homes, reading, uh, I mean, learning uh, Arabic language, whatever it may be. I'm just all over the place. Circles of knowledge all over the place, Iqwan. And anyone who's been there knows I'm not exaggerating. I'm probably not giving it justice. Circles of learning everywhere acquire people concerned for learning their deen. Now. Now, concerned for learning the affairs of their, of their deen. In all of the different sciences in Quran of the and he said, good knowledge in good in a good environment, in good weather, like this. And he says, well, And the virtue of that is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. I wanted to mention one more thing in Quran and then we'll, we'll end this inshallah ta'ala. The Shaykh encouraged us in our studies to take a takhasus, to find a specialization. Just try to specialize. Of course, after, as we'll see in a second, I'll read from his advice. After learning the fundamentals of the different sciences, enough that you are grounded in fiqh, in tafsir, in, in Arabic, and all those things, to take for yourself some kind of tukhusus, some kind of specialization in relation to those sciences. And there were indeed, there were people that you would know about who were, you know, they were in a particular science. If you look at the Sheikh's uh, autobiography, he mentioned some of his students, sometimes they'll mention what they were strong in. Fulan al Bahath al Qawi, so and so is a strong researcher. Fulan yani, is a yani, Lugawi, he's a, a Nahmi, he's a grammarian, for example. And the Shaykh encouraged the students to, to take a specialization. And look what he says here. He says, Likewise, I advise you to choose a specialization. After learning what you need from the different sciences, as I mentioned, what the hustles is that usul, and having a special a specialization in something has an origin in the sunnah. Look at the shape, taking everything back to the tab of the sunnah. Evidence. Having a specialization, he says, has an origin in the sunnah. And he says, from his Sahihain, in the two Sahihs of Bukhari and Muslim, عن حذيفة. رَجِلَهُ عِنْهُ قَالْ كَانَ النَّاسِ أَسْأَلُونَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ وسلم عَنِ الْخَيْرِ وَكُنْتُ أَسْأَلُهُ عَنِ الشَّرِ 
مخافت لن يزيكني He said the people used to ask about their son about the good stuff I used to ask about the bad fearing that it would reach me So that means he specialized in that issue of those bad things that were to come or might happen That was a specialization So if someone wanted to know about those bad things they had to go to for the after the message of Allah said So that shows us the benefit in having a specialty. So now, for example, in the message, if somebody has an issue with, you know, in a matter of fiqh, you know, fulani, you know, it's a couple of chassas, fiqh. Or someone has an issue with, you know, in, in the lugah, in the Arabic, you know, fulani, it's nahmi. We go to him, we can sit with him. And so having a specialization, the client has its benefits. And as the sheikh, he mentions here, the client has its origins. It has its origins. In the Sunnah, as we see here in the narration of Hurdayfa. Finally, Ikhwan ibn Fikum, we heard Ikhwan that it reached us that the likes of Shaykh Rabir, Shaykh Wana Shaykh Rabir, Hafizahullah Ta'ala, in his praise of the Marquis of Shaykh Muqbal during his days. But of course, Ikhwan, that which I mentioned in these lessons is strictly and specifically about the days of Shaykh Muqbal. Shaykh Rabi was reported that he said that a year or so are like this in the Maj may be equivalent to years in other universities and institutions. And for those of you who were there or who know about the Sikhwan, then one can see the, the veracity and the, the validity of that tremendous statement. And one of the reasons for this Sikhwan is that the lessons were daily. And by daily, I mean seven days a week. So other people in other institutions, Iqwan, universities or otherwise, they're weekends. So a student's not studying, for example, on Friday or Saturday or Saturday or Sunday, whatever it may be, in their locales, they're off for the weekend. And the magic was seven days a week. There were no summer vacations, right? So students may, in the university or otherwise, and when I downplay universities, where I'm making a point here of the follow of that time of the match. That's the point that we're making here. There are no summer vacations. So it's not like, okay, from May to August, whatever, and you're off on vacation. No. Lessons are seven days a week, summer, winter, spring, fall. There were no days off during Ramadan. And to the point of when I remember that during the Bukhari class, you could tell that the, the crowd thinned out a little bit. I was like, Shaykh Mubil, Yanni Ben Saja, he censured and rebuked the students. He said, was it haram to study Ramadan? I remember like it was yesterday, hearing the Shaykh saying from his chair, seeing in my eyes, right now, my head, right now, my head. And to the point of when, where again, without exaggeration, I remember on the day of the Eid, I remember I said to myself, there's no way we have a class on that Eid. <laughs> After Salat al Asr, the Shaykh got up in that chair, called him al Bukhari, Haddathana. Yom al Eid, yeah, one. Seven days a week. No weekends, no summer vacations. There were no distractions. There were no restaurants. There were no cybers. There were. The one, the one phone we had in the camp was this little small little phone that ran by car battery. <laughs> and when the battery would get hot, that was it. <laughs> the phone calls were over. And I think it was once a week, if I remember correctly, and the brothers in there can remind me, I believe it was once a week you got phone calls, you could make phone calls or whatever. And sometimes like a big person would call you, and somebody, they have to tell you to call back in like a half an hour, somebody have to come get you. He had to come back over. Sometimes there'd be a long line out there trying to get there to use the phone. Like I said, the, the line be long, the battery get hot. That's it. Right? Nobody else could make calls that day. So there were no distractions. So people focus on their studies. I mean, if you waste the time there, if you were really, you were, you were, I mean, diligent in wasting time. <laughs> if you found a way to waste time there, you were diligent in wasting time. A lot of the people. So there were no vacations in Quran, uh, yani, rather, what we had, the studies with our shaykh, and sitting with our shaykh, sitting with the students, and this in Quran is what differentiated 
The tremendous mark is a tremendous ma'ad of our Shaykh al Hadith with a match from other than it from institutions, universities, and centers of learning. And I wanted to mention quickly, Ikhwan, as I said, I touched on it before the last time I saw the Shaykh, I came on Allah Ta'ala, and I think it, for me, I, it, 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 I wanted to mention it because it helps kind of bring things full circle. The Sheikh, when he became ill, when he first went to Sana'a for treatment, and it was said that there was nothing that could be done there, and that he would have to be sent abroad for the treatment. And he went to, of course, when he went to the kingdom of Saudi Arabia at the expenses of the royal family and the, and the government, the kingdom there, may Allah preserve them and reward them for their love of the scholars and their support of the scholars of this family. This is something that has been known they find from the time of Muhammad al Wahhab, the time of Shaykh Abdul Qarawi, to this very day of ours, may Allah preserve that nation. And so the Shaykh went there. To the point where it was said that there was nothing that could be done, and he was a, it was mentioned to him that in America that they were advanced as it relates to, to dealing with uh, the liver. The Sheikh had issues with his liver, liver disease. And so he was brought to Cedar Sinai Hospital in Los Angeles, California. Some of my brothers had informed me of the Sheikh's arrival. And so we booked our tickets and we went to see the Sheikh. And initially went to the, the hotel, actually the hotel that I was in, where some of the Sheikh's companions, who were travel companions, were brought in and were taking care of him. But there, some of the brothers I was with in the match. And we saw each other and hugged and embraced there at the hotel. And they called over to the hospital to let the, the Sheikh know that I was there and I was coming over. So when I got to see the side of the hospital, and at this time, the Quran Sheikh was sick. He was, it was clear. I could see the Sheikh when I walked in the room. It was clear that the Sheikh had, I mean, thinned out even more and he was not well, or him, Allah Ta'ala. But he was still Sheikh Muhammad. I came in the room, Ikhwan, after giving salams, I said, Shafat Allah, Ya Sheikh, Shafat Al Kamil, Ya Malik, Ya Tibi Arab, Shafat Allah. Ya Sheikh, I had the dua. I had the dua, Ya Sheikh. So even the dua is making me do the grammatical. Yeah, the inflection of the dua, Allah Ta'ala. So we sat with the Shaykh, and it was a beautiful jealousy, it was a beautiful sitting. The doctor came in and explained some things to me about what was going on with the Shaykh, and he showed, they showed me the scans and the different um, results and the things like that. And, you know, the Shaykh, again, in great spirit, still asking me questions, different questions, and in Hadith and in Arabic. And, it was a joyous and a beautiful occasion to be with the Sheikh. As sad as I was to see him sick, he was still Sheikh Muhammad, still firm upon the Sunnah, still teaching, still concerned with knowledge. And I remember quite before I left, I asked the Sheikh, yeah, I mean, just for some parting advice, matters of Dawa, matters of, uh, of, of, of Menhaj and the likes of this. And as they're giving me some, some beautiful words, some short words, and quite some brief words, as the Sheikh was ill and we didn't want to overburden him, I remember one of the things the Sheikh he said to me, he said, I advise you with the likes, returning these affairs to the likes of Sheikh Rabi ibn Hadi al For indeed, he is a man who has great experience as it relates to the methodologies and the personalities of these groups. And that was one of the last advices that I heard from Sheikh Rabi Sheikh Mokbil before we left. He parted with the Sheikh there, and that will be the last time I will see him, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. At any rate, Ikhwan, I'm thankful to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for allowing us to come together. Over these last couple of days, it has been a tremendous yani, affair for me. And I'm thankful to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for your patience and your good thought of your brother. And I pray to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that we did some justice to our Sheikh's biography and to that tremendous market, that tremendous institute that he 
established. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to continue to make that which we have learned from him a benefit and a salat jariya for him. So there are a few questions, I guess we'll take them now. I know we go over the time, I think. Yeah, it's all good. Yeah, it's all good. Yeah, it's all good. Yeah, it's all What would you advise? Marry first or seek knowledge? Huh? Oh, I thought that was your question. Allah will start. If one, of course we would advise the person who does not have a need to marry, a need, a strong need to marry, would advise them with striving to study the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as they're able in their early years especially. Because once you marry one, there's no question that it busies you. It takes from your time. Now, there's another side of the argument that a wife helps you because now you have someone to you know, cook for you and care for you and those kinds of things. And that also in and of itself is a benefit. But there's no question that once you marry and you have children, things change. Responsibilities and taking care of uh, the family and stuff comes at that particular moment and point. And it does make it more difficult. It does make it a bit more difficult to study. So for the young student who does not have a need to marry, and I keep emphasizing that point about not having a need to marry, he has a need to marry, and we say, marry. And that is from the, the narration of the Prophet Wasallam, <laughs> or youth, whoever has the ability to marry, then they marry. Who narrates that hadith? Abdullah ibn Masrud. Elected by the Sahih and the Sunnah. Whoever, oh youth, whoever has the ability to marry, then let him marry. Because marriage is. Well, no, not in the narration. <laughs> it, it helps to lower the gaze and protects the private parts. Now, so no question in mind that we have clearly the. Command of the Messenger of Allah sent them in the narration to marry. Whoever's not able to marry, then fast, right? At the end of that narration. Fast is a protection. Um, so we say, Ikhwan, that if one does not have a need to marry, as a young person, then perhaps they can seek knowledge for some time, at least get the foundation, the fundamentals of their affair down. Allah ibn Fiqo, before marrying. However, if they do have a need to marry, then they should marry. And protect themselves, as we mentioned in that region of Abdullah and Masood. Allah knows best. Who from the Muhaddithun do we rely on for tahqiq of hadith? And I'm assuming by tahqiq they mean uh, the hukum. Uh, the grading of the narrations. Allah knows best. But of course, Ikhwan, the, the Muhaddith of this Asr. Sheikh Muhammad Nasr al Albani, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, Ikhwan, beyond the shadow of a doubt, Ikhwan, 
is a mountain as it relates to the checking of the ahadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Here's a man who spent over 60 years, more than 60 years, in the study of the hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu and in the clarification of the sound from the weak. Simply through the narration, simply through the chains of transmission, in the Sunnah of Abi Dawood, in the Jam of Ibn Tirmidhi, in the Sunnah of Ibn Ubaj, in the Sa'i, Abu Dawood, and other than that, the from the different works. And clarifying the authentic from the weak. And as Shaykh Munashaykh Muqbal and others have mentioned, the, Quran, the books of Shaykh Al-Bani, one's library, cannot do without the books of Shaykh Al-Bani, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. A library is not a library without the works of Shaykh Al-Bani, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. So one looks through those works of Quran and finds and looks to see that which Sheikh Nasser has authenticated, that which he has read weak. And as some of the scholars have mentioned the one from them, the likes of Sheikh Al-Sheikh Mukhbun and Sheikh Urdaymi and others, if Sheikh Al-Bani makes a narration of Da'if, Abdul Ali Ali have a Nawaj, bite down on it with your loyalty, right? The point of the Shahid from this Ikhwan, Abu Rifikum, is that Sheikh Al-Bani is from those scholars who we refer to and return to as it relates to the checking of narrations and the authentication of narrations. Now, we know that sometimes scholars differ. And Shaykh al-Albani, the great muhaddith of his asr was not masoom, it was not infallible. So if there is a difference of opinion regarding a narration, the authenticity of a narration, or the weakness of a narration, Shaykh al Shaykh Mukbil said, one has two, two paths. If the person is a, is a talim of Tamekkin, is a strong student of hadith, strong student of knowledge, and has the ability to go through the narrations, go through the chains for himself, and to strive to arrive at the truth between what those two scholars have gone to, then this is what he advises for that strong student. As with a common person, he does not have that ability. They let him look to the scholar that is trusted in that affair. Let him rely on that scholar's ruling. Again, as the Sheikh always said, Sheikh Mokul was firm against the But striving to the best of one's ability to learn as much as they can to arrive at the truth for his or herself. And to the point when the Sheikh would say that every person has the ability to keep asking questions, so somebody says to you, the Prophet said, said, and so the person, even the, the common person says, yeah, well, who, where, where, where did you get that from? They say, well, it's, been, it's in the hadith. So even the common person will say, well, where's the hadith found? Oh, well, the hadith said in Mumaja. Even the common person will say, well, who authenticated it? Right? The point that Sheikh Mokbel was making is even the common person can ask enough questions to try to arrive at something of the truth. That's the point that he was making in that regard. At any rate, the answer to the question is the likes of Muhammad Nasruddin al Albani, rahimahullah ta'ala, that even his enemies, even his enemies from the people of innovation, they want to go into their libraries and see the books of al Albani on the shelves. And even if they don't admit it, they still, they, they plagiarize and steal from the shade all the time. Rahimahullah <laughs> Not a marriage question. <laughs> we dealt with this last night. Hadith. Um, there's no prayer when the food is served, or when one is needs to relieve himself. We mentioned that la uh, narration last night. Uh, if you go, and that what is intended there is that if one has to relieve himself, that he will be distracted from his prayer. Write it down. I don't have a huh? Okay, I didn't know what happened to the paper out here. Now they're going to talk about it, they're going to say I'm, I'm being harsh again. He shot this piece of paper in the pen and followed you. Yeah. And so the point is, Khatib al-Baghdadi, 
In that book that I talked about earlier, Al Jamir, Yahlak al Rabi with Dabi Samir, he has a, a special chapter, a specific chapter on the instruments of a student of knowledge. And he talks about how the scholars of the past would make sure they had the proper pens and ink. I mean, you read about the scholars who would choose different color inks because the color lasted longer. That's how, that's how diligent they were in Quran in their studies. They would think about, will green ink actually last long so we'll use green ink? You find this kind of stuff in these books. And they talked about the kind of paper that they would choose. Paper that lasted longer. Paper that didn't decompose quickly. Right? This is the kind of stuff that Quran and Fikram that you will find from the likes of al Khatib and other daddy. So we should always be prepared in our lessons. And yes, nowadays you can use the computer or the tablet or the phone. I don't want anybody to say that I'm, you can only use a piece of paper and a pen. Alive and Fikram, that's not my intent. At any rate, If one has to relieve himself and it's time to pray, then he will not have any for sure in his prayer. He will be more focused on relieving himself and therefore, whatever the fecal may will distract him from his salah. And also, with the food, if one is hungry and the food is presented, you won't have for sure, you'll be hungry, you'll be thinking about that food as opposed to your prayer. However, the scholar mentioned that if one takes enough of the food to satiate himself, to satisfy himself, he should do that and go pray. Right? And then go pray. By the narrations concerning the son of a that traveling and studying with the, with the scholars, with their wives, uh, I'm sure. I've heard Shaykh Mukbil would hold the durus with a jinn. And you would have, I don't know anything about that, I know about his lecture, Nusihati li ahlu sunnah min jinn. My advice to the, the jinn from ahlu sunnah. That I know about. Other than that, I've never heard that before. Allah knows best. Hmm. How did you balance seeking knowledge in Yemen and taking care of your family? Well, Alhamdulillah, again, as I mentioned before, Ikhwan, as far as see, studying in Yemen, the beautiful thing in Damascus, is, as I said, there was nothing there to spend money on. If I had a bunch of money, I would have just, just had a bunch of money. There was really nothing to spend money on. You had some money, book, a few books if you could, or food, you know, things like that, of course, but there wasn't any money to buy anything too precious or anything like that, or any need for anything like that. So the money that we had, that we saved, that we tucked away from working, I worked, tucked away some money, and we traveled. From that, we built our home. I believe I spent $700 on my house, building my house. I think it was $700. And I had a concrete roof, I told you. Had one of those nice, the fine roofs. Uh, they, made, they would put the wood down, the wood planks first down, and, and the beams across it, and then they would put the cement on top. And like that, I think it was $700, like $700, something like that. It wasn't much. But it was from money that I had saved, and then, of course, as I said, there was nothing there to spend money on, right? The other thing was, which was interesting, is, of course, Iquan, as I said to you, the students who were single, they... Uh, they, they got three meals a day. The first meal was, as I said, that food, that those beans, the watery beans with the bread. The meal after Dhuhr was rice with a tomato sauce. Who was here in the match? Who remembers that, that rice and tomato sauce? Nobody was here. That rice and tomato sauce. And then for dinner, that food again. <laughs> the food from the morning. And so the three meals. As for the married students, we got a stipend. It wasn't a lot. 
And I can't remember the value now, but I want to say my wife said, I think she said 3,000, I asked her as I was trying to recall this, recollect this, I think she said 3,000 Yemeni reals, which was about $30 or something like that, I think. I can't remember, anybody I can remind me. I have to ask uh, Hassan later on, the time, but I believe it was around that. And it was enough to get you, like, your rice and your... The flour and the sugar, that kind of stuff. You know, your, your, your staple foods, your, your small necessities. And that's all we needed. We, we, we had, we would suffice there. So there wasn't really no need at that particular time as it relates to uh, taking care of the family. We, we left. Um, however, at other instances and other moments in our studies and traveling in Egypt and different places, one would have to work and provide for their family and study at the same time. And again, I go back to that tremendous book by Khalil al-Baghdadi, the collection of the etiquettes of the seeker of knowledge. There's a, a, a chapter about providing for one's family before seeking knowledge. And he mentions in that chapter a narration of a student who traveled in Lihla to a teacher. And when he got to that teacher, the teacher said, what did you leave your family from provisions? And he kind of said, well, not much. And the sheikh told him, go back and provide for your family, then come back and study. So, of course, one has to be able to balance between the two affairs. And again, we know that many of the scholars of the past, rather than some of the NBI, of course, we know worked. Musa, I didn't say that worked. Right? You know, some of the scholars had positions. Abu Hanifa sold uh, fabrics, materials. Right? Shibbal al Bani fixed watches. That's how he made his living. He actually fixed watches and he was studying it outside of fixing watches to provide for himself and for his family. And Shaykh al actually said that he thanked his father for two things. He said, I first thank my father for making hijrah from, of course, Albania to Damascus, to Syria. He said, because of that, I learned the Arabic language. Otherwise, I would have been you know, there in, in Europe, would not have been able to learn the Arabic language. And by the way, Ikhwan, Sheikh al I don't know if anyone's ever heard the recordings, he spoke Albanian. You could hear him on some of those recordings. I, I thought one day I was like, I know I know a little Arabic. <laughs> but the Sheikh was actually speaking Albanian. And so he thanked his father for making Hidra because because of that, he learned the Arabic language. And I believe mean, the Sheikh mentioned he started studying Arabic around the age of 10. I think he said he was around the age of 10. Um, in, his, in, his, in those recordings that he did on his life. And he mentioned that when he used to be in class, he loved Arabic, though. He was Ajimi, non-Arab, but he loved Arabic. And to the point where the teacher used to put a little line of poetry on the board. And he would ask the students to do the Arab of that, that line of poetry, and, and none of them would be able to do it. And the teacher would say, I know who can do it. And he would point to al uh, bani and he would say, uh, and he do it, and he said, the Sheikh said, well, subtle had it been telling that. And the Sheikh said, I hit it with one word, got it, and killed it. <laughs> and so the Sheikh, in that regard, Quran, even though he's from the Ajah, from the non-Arabs, he began to, you know, he learned in the affairs of the Arabic language, and I would view them. And Quran, this is something that, and I always mention this as an encouragement for our brothers who are from the non-Arabs, those of us who are from the non-Arabs, this is a reminder. First of all, if you look at the authors of the six books of Hadith, they were from the Ajim. From the Ajim. The non-Arabs. Also, is anybody familiar with the scholar Atta ibn Abi Rabah? You know where he was from? He was Nubi. He was Nubi. And it says in his biography, it says in his biography, that when he would pronounce the word qul, like say, he would say qul, like eat. He had problems with some of the huruf, some of the bakhari, some of the huruf. But with that, they say he was, he was afta bin leaf. And he had more fit than some of the great scholars of fit at the time. Ajim, not Arab, I tell him he's tired sometimes. But the shahid of the point from all that, the if you can shake that back, he thinks is. Father for making him refer. The second was for teaching him how to fix watches. Because he says, he says, because from that I made my living. From that I made my living. And of course, you know, Sheikh Mashaykh Mukul also, when he first came to the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, he worked 
as something of a security guard like this during the day and also studying in the evening. Two people ask me the last question that she asked me. I'll get to that uh, before we end. I'll get to that, inshallah. We'll do two more and we'll end, inshallah. Someone asks, what is your advice for the Salafi who belittles his sins, deluded by the fact he is on the right Aqid al Minhaj, believing that this will save him because he stays away from Bidah? Well, let me, let me say something, Ikhwan. I've heard people use, make this argument about Salafis. I, never, I have never heard a Salafi say, because I'm on the proper methodology and Aqid my sins don't matter. I've never heard that. And I have to be honest with mine that I've only heard this from people who are attacking the Salafis. Now, I'm not saying the questioning here is of that ilk, but I have only heard that from people who mean to attack the Salafis. I have never met a Salafi who means to demean sins. Allah bin Fikum, rather, Quran, what we have seen from the Salafis, Allah bin Fikum, as Shaykh, as Shaykh, Allah being mentioned, even from the sinners, from Ahl Sunnah, that they love the people of Sunnah and they love the truth, they know they have weaknesses and they want to do better, they want to be better. And this is what we know with Quran Laibir Fiqo. How many years the Quran and Amr Sajid have we studied in Tibayah, the book of the major sins? How many years have we studied, for example, in Quran, Riyadh al-Salihin, Shaykh Mokbil mentioned in advice to the women, of course, dealing with some of those affairs of Nukayat and other than that. How many times are we studying the affairs of repentance and the punishments for sins and the likes of this? So therefore, this idea of swans, one of the people of the Sunnah belittling sins, I have, me personally, I don't know that to be the case. And if there are some individuals out there who have this corrupt understanding of belittling sins, and we say, we simply say, what Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said is found in the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari. Al-Mu'min yara dhulubahu ka'anhu tahta al-jabal ka'da yaha alim The believer, the true believer, is fearful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He sees his sins like he is at the base of a mountain and that mountain is about to fall down upon him. Well, Fasib, as for the, the criminal, the wicked sinner. He sees his sins like a fly that lands on his nose and he just goes like this. Right? So in that narration, what we see, of course, is that one does not make belittlement of sins. To the point, Ikhwan, what we learned in the life of the study of Al-Kaba'i, by Al-Dhahab, and then that Ikhwan, as some of the scholars said, that one should not even get into this idea of a sin being a, a minor sin. Even though we know that there are major sins and minor sins, but those sins are minor in relation to sins that are greater than them. Not that they are minor in and of themselves. To the point where the scholars say, don't look at the minuteness of a sin, look at the greatness of the one you are disobeying. So to the point of going, this is what we learn from Ahl Sunnah. We don't make light of sin, we don't belittle sins, this thing is serious. How many ayahs in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how many narrations from the Prophet Sallam and instruct us and show us the punishment of, uh, of the people of sin? Unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pardons and forgives them. So there's no question in Quran that one does not be little sin. And from our creed and from our belief is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is deserving of worship alone. And the muwahid, the muwahid in truth, 
I said, well, the earth man makes me. Is the one who free, who strives and free his religion, frees his religion from shit and all of its types. And frees his religion from innovation in all of its types. And strives to free himself from ma'ashiyah against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all of its types. This is the number one. Allah have a few more. So at any rate, Allah knows best about that question. But we know, Ikhwan, when we think that one does not make light of sins, but there's no doubt also that the sinner from Ahl Sunnah is better than the staunch worshiper of the people of innovation. Imam Ahmed said that the grave of the person of Ahl Sunnah from the sinners is a road in the Jannah, is a garden in the gardens of paradise, and the grave of the Worshipper from the people of innovation is a pit from the hellfire. Is a Mursal mursa Hadith acted upon? Uh, the Mursal Hadith is a knife. It is from a narration that is weak. There's intikidar. There's a break in the chain of narration. A Mursal Hadith, Ikhwan, as there are different types of break, breaks in chains of, of narrations, so you have a break at the beginning of a chain which is mu'allaq. A single break at the beginning of a chain is mu'allaq. And you have a single break within the, in the middle of a chain, muntati'. And you have a break at the end of a chain which is mursal. Which means a tabi'i says, call Rasulullah or fa'ala Rasulullah A tabi'i says, the Prophet said or did. Well, we know that the tabiri, no matter how great the tabiri may be, is not a companion. Which means he did not hear the narration directly from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So who did he hear it from? He may have heard it from a companion, it's possible. And if that was the case, then the narration would be authentic, whoever that companion may be. However, we do know that some tabiri, of course, narrated on other tabiri. That tabiri could be, let me zip up. That tabi'i that he narrates on could be weak. We don't know. So because you don't know who that is that he narrated upon, and because of that break in the chain of narration, of course that narration is from, is counted from the weak narrations of therefore no, it is not a hurtja in the deen. Well, I've seen several questions The last question that the Sheikh asked me was the difference between the Hadith Shad and Ziyad al Thiqa. A Shad Hadith and a Hadith that is Ziyad al Thiqa. A Shad Hadith, in the science of Hadith, an authentic narration must meet five conditions. To start the Senate, the chain must be connected, as we mentioned earlier, a Muslim, a chain from, connected from the first narrator all the way to the end of the chain of narration, in this case, to the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It must also be by the narration of the truthful 
and precise. So those are two conditions. Truthful, sadiq, and ghabit. So they must be truthful, upright, and they must be precise. And precision is of two types. Dabdul sada or dabdul kitab. Memorizing by heart and memorizing or oh, preserving your knowledge well in books. So again, connect the chain of narration by the narration of a trustworthy, upright, precise narrator. It cannot have any shaluv, any contradiction. So that's shad. Shad means it's contradictory to that which is stronger than it or more in number than it. So for example, if, one, if a trustworthy narrator has to be trustworthy. If a trustworthy narrator narrates something that contradicts other narrators that are stronger than him or more in number than him in strength, then he is considered that instant shaft, the narration is shaft, therefore it is rejected. However, the Adam of is now when a trustworthy narrator doesn't contradict the other narrators, he simply adds something to it that they didn't hear. So for example, there may have been several different sittings, for example, and maybe that particular student heard something in, in one sitting that the other student didn't hear. And he just mentions, he just adds what he heard or what he saw from the teacher that the others didn't hear or see. He's trustworthy, so therefore we take that additional wording from him because he's only adding something that the others didn't relate or narrate. However, if we know that they were all in the same sittings, for example, all of them were together in the same sittings, and one particular narrator narrates something that the others didn't narrate, and they're stronger than him, and that instance is Shav. He has contradicted them. And so in that instance, that's the difference between Shav and between the others. So that was the last question we asked him. Or him or in, the, in the hospital that day. <laughs> The example of the uh, of a shad hadith, I started a little trouble before I leave. <laughs> example of a shad, hey, you knew I was getting ready to do it. You knew I was getting ready to do it. So, the moving of the finger and the shad, let's do it, let's do it. It's probably really good. So the narration of the Prophet Sallam and Shad of Sababati that he pointed with his index finger. And in a wording it says, well, you have and he moved it. However, that addition was only reported by Zaida ibn Qudama, one narrator. He contradicts 13 other narrators. And Zaida ibn Qudama, by the way, is not much on facts. He's from the highest levels of, of precision and memorization. It's not we're not going to play around with Zaida ibn Qudama. But look who he contradicts. Sufyan ibn Uriyana, Amir al-Mu'mineen for the Hadith. Sufyan al-Thawri, Amir al-Mu'mineen for the Hadith. Shu'ab ibn Hajjaj, Amir al-Mu'mineen for the Hadith. Abdullah ibn Mubarak, I mean, I can go on. So the point here, Ikhwan, is that out of all of those narrators, all of them narrate that the Prophet said him pointed with his fingers, only, his fingers to me, only Zaki that mentions that he moved it. So he contradicts those who are more than him in number and those who are stronger than him in number. He alone, right? Now, Sheikh Wana Sheikh Lukbil said, if that's not Shav, then Shav doesn't exist. <laughs> if, that, if that narration is not Shav, that wording is not Shav, then what's a Shav narration? It fits every criteria of a Shav narration. Sheikh al Bani, in Tamam al Minna, he actually. In this issue, he praises a book that was written by one of the students in the Maj Ahmed Sa'id, Shaykh Wana Shaykh Luk, that actually sought from him to compile this work, Ahmed Sa'id, strong in Ba'ath and research. He was actually my research teacher there in the Maj. He compiled a book on the moving of the finger, in which he gathered together all of the chains, many of the chains of narration and sifts through them and, and brings the kalam of the ulama. And as Shaykh Mukla mentions in the introduction, again, if this is not a shad hadith, then a shad hadith doesn't exist. 
The Shaykh al-Bani actually mentions this book in Tamam al-Minna and he praises it. He says, indeed, in the book you can see the author was diligent in gathering the chains of narration and sifting through them with the work that we hope that Allah will reward him from for lacking. <laughs> However, and of course, Sheikh Nasser go, you know, goes on and, and gives his position. And he says it's from Ziyad al Thiqah. Basically, Sheikh Nasser argues it's from Ziyad al Thiqah. The problem here, again, Ikhwan, is that we, as Sheikh Mukbul and the others have mentioned, that we do not have any, anything to show that he heard something outside of those circles of those formal students of, the, of their teacher. And therefore, in this instance, one would have to rule that with being shad, as opposed to the absolute thiqah. Allah knows best. Like what if you know? Oh. I can't remember the code. 